Thank God. Praise the Lord. I was thinking, um, my wife said, I don't talk anything negative today. I want to be positive. <laughs> and that's true. She's right. And, and because you can listen to the news, and it just, I don't know about you, but I get aggravated is what I get. I get upset. Amen. Because all you hear is negative things about how this country is going down and we're never going to recover again. But I kind of think like the missionary was talking about. Yeah. Amen. You, you can focus on that thing, all the obstacles, all the things that are coming against you, and you can get distracted by that. Or you can see that there is still a great open door and an opportunity right. for revival. Yes. You can talk about the negative things and negative aspects and all this, a divided country and different opinions. You can let that distract you, but the truth of the matter is that we still live in the greatest nation on the face of this earth. We are still free to gather in the house of the Lord and worship Him however we want to do that. We can believe what we want to believe, and that we have opportunities in this country that you won't find in any other country on the face of this earth. Amen. I appreciate the fact that I live in the United States of America. How about you? that other countries don't have. Even countries that claim to be free, they don't have the freedoms and liberties that we have in the United States. Yeah. But there is, there is freedoms that government can give, and there's control that government can give. Amen. But there is an even greater freedom that you can experience in your life, and that's the freedom from the grips of sin. Yes. Amen. And aren't you thankful that Jesus died on the cross, yes. shed his blood? Amen. Amen. So sin does not have to control you. Amen. Amen. Mistakes and failures in your past don't have to define who you are. Amen. The Bible says that when you are filled with the Holy Ghost, you come to the Lord. Old things are passed away. All things yes. become brand new. Yes. It's a big, great door that's open in front of you. And you can walk into a brand new experience. Amen. I'm thankful for the Lord this morning. Thankful to be in the house of God. Glad for everyone that's here. We're going to have a great time. We're going to worship Jesus you. Jesus is the answer. Hallelujah.
when I tell you what I was reading. Amen. I was reading that scripture where Jesus said, Whom the Son, the Bible says, Whom the Son has set free. Yes. Is free indeed. And that's what I was talking about just a little while ago. Amen. You can be free and live in the greatest country in the world and still be bound by sin. Right. Amen. If you can have an experience with Jesus. Yes. Amen. My wife and I, we were just driving around yesterday. I think, I think I was talking to Don before church. They did a little driving themselves yesterday. But we were driving down toward on 71, just going south. And, and we were talking about just people that we know. That people that we've been praying for at the end of these services. People that have once been in church and aren't here today. And they struggle, and you see their lives, and I just thought, I said, I don't understand. If they only knew the peace and the joy and the happiness that comes yes. of having a relationship with Jesus, yes. and then their lives would be so much better. But they claim to be free because they're not bound by the need to be at church on a Sunday morning. And got a whole, their view is skewed so bad. And I just want the Lord to open their eyes. So they yes, can see. yes. And that it's just a good life living yes. for the Lord. Yes. Laying your head on the pillow at night and knowing that if you don't wake up in the morning, everything's still going to be all right. Yes. Amen. Yes. Just having that peace and that contentment in the Holy Ghost. Amen. Just every day, walking with God. It's a good life yes. for the Lord. I know they sing that sometimes, and it's more than a song. That's really how it is. Can we stand together? I want to go to the Lord in prayer. Amen. We have a lot of people that are out, obviously, today. It's a long holiday weekend, and we understand that. There are some people that aren't here this morning because they're sick and don't feel well. We want to pray for them. Amen. Let's pray for this service pray above everything Lord. else. I mean, I know that... We're celebrating, and I feel patriotic. I can't help but when I look at that flag and they sing the battle hymn of the Republic, I get emotional about that because I still understand what a blessed people we are to live yes. here. Amen. And I understand that it wasn't free. Amen. And there's people like Brother Raymond and like my dad that fought so we can have these liberties. Amen. And I respect them. Amen. Yeah. And I don't Amen. ever want to lose that. Amen. Amen. So let's just pray. Let's pray for this service. Pray for those that are sick this morning. Amen. Just want God to have his way and minister to us in this house. Amen. Amen. Let's just talk to the Lord. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus, we love you, Lord. And thank you, God, for the opportunity to be in your house today. God, we understand that we are blessed people, Lord. God, and even to be in this house and to feel your presence like we already do, understanding the love that you have for us, God. My Lord, even though we're undeserving, Jesus, you still love us more than anybody else could ever love us, God. We pray this morning that you would inhabit our praise, that your spirit would fill this house, God, that you would touch us, oh Lord, strengthen us, God. I pray, Lord, those that are unable to be here, Jesus, let it be sick and serving. Maybe they're enjoying the vacation, God. I pray that they feel the touch of the Lord even now, God. That you would minister to them, Lord. Give them strength, Jesus, Lord. Have your way here this morning, God. Our best our attention, Jesus, for the next few minutes, Lord. Help us be in tune with the Spirit, Lord.
They begin to shout and dance. Amen. Jump and run. Amen. And I've been there. And I've seen that. And I understand because they realize the difference that Jesus has made in their lives. And then I also see in that same situation, people that have been in church for years sitting there wondering what all the commotion's about. As if they don't remember that same, that they were the same way. And then until God touched them. How do we forget? Amen. We don't ever need to forget the ditch that we were dug from. And where God reached out and plucked us from. Amen. The Bible says such for some of you. Amen. But you've been washed. You've been cleansed. You've been justified by the Spirit of the Lord. I never want to forget that. Amen. Praise the Lord. I love it when people shout and when they dance and they are touched by the Spirit. See the change. Amen. When they realize that their sins are gone. Amen. And that load has been lifted. And there's a freedom that they're experiencing that they've never felt before. Amen. It's a wonderful thing. Praise God. We're going to receive our Sunday morning time and offering. Christian, would you get that and just, if you'll just bring it right here. What I want us to do, I want you to shake hands with somebody. I want you to greet your neighbor, amen. Maybe walk with them. We're going to bring our tithe and our offering and give it to the Lord this morning. Amen. Sing something. The Lord bless you.
Praise the Lord. Ooh, praise glory. the Lord. Glory. Yeah, before I forget about it, I want to say Ooh. the church looks good. Thank you. Yes, I think does. it was probably Sister Betty and maybe Sister <laughs> Conrad. I don't know who oh, all that great Sister Peggy. Whoever who did that. I knew I'd get in trouble trying to guess who it was. But I want you to know we appreciate yes. the church being clean yes. and nice yes. and best. And we appreciate that so much. Amen. It makes a difference. Amen. All of us doing our part. Praise God. I'm going to turn the service to Brother Dixon. I know it's kind of seems like a little odd time maybe to do that, but Something happened in the spirit last week with that missionary that was here. Amen. And I know Brother Dixon mentioned it on Wednesday night, but he was definitely sit here from the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. And it was to let this church know that in spite of everything, that there is an open door. There is an opportunity for revival. And it's time for us to step into our purpose. Amen. And that's what I want us to focus on. Amen, Brother Dixon is going to come to preach to us. Amen. Let's just ask the Lord to have his way and anoint our pastor. Jesus, we love you, God. We thank you, Jesus, for the spirit of the Lord that is evident in this house, God. We know you come to minister, Lord, to talk to hearts today, to give direction, God. Pray that you would anoint Brother Dixon this morning to speak in our hearing what the spirit would say to this church in this hour, God. My Lord, give us the boldness to respond to the spirit of God today. In Jesus' name, can we give the Lord a hand clap of praise? Hallelujah, Lord. Sorry that you have been standing so long. Would you stay standing for just a minute? And let's turn toward this American flag. Imagine everybody in here this morning knows the Pledge of Allegiance, so let's go through that. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands. One nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Hallelujah. And I don't think we can leave out the Christian flag this morning. I pledge allegiance to the Christian flag and to the Savior for whose kingdom it stands. One Savior, crucified, risen, and coming again with life and liberty for all those who believe. Praise the Lord. Praise God. Give the Lord a hand clap. God bless you. You can be seated. Um, uh, learn that Pledge of Allegiance in the summer of 1956. When I was in the first grade, we said that every morning, every morning, it never failed. And it also never failed that when we were finished with the Pledge of Allegiance, there was always some kid in the back that said, Amen. <laughs> and our teacher, Sister Elsie Holdfield, would remind us about every morning you don't have to say amen after the allegiance. I didn't know it then, but I got a feeling that those kids were probably Pentecostals. <laughs> and they were just kind of used to saying amen. Hallelujah. And then after that, uh, there was a singing. I don't know if y'all did that in first grade or not, but we did every, every day. Morning, it always started with the Pledge of Allegiance, and we'd sing, My country, tis of thee, sweet land of liberty, to thee I sing. Right. Land of the pilgrim's pride, land where our fathers died. From every mountainside, let freedom ring. Yes. Praise God. Yes. Probably, um, didn't understand that real well when we were just children. We probably didn't understand it all. I, I suppose that being blessed to live in the land that we lived in, we probably just kind of took it for granted. Right. 
And we lived in a country where we were at liberty and where we were free. Praise the Lord. Right. Now there are some that say that our freedom is in jeopardy. There are some that say that our religious freedom is in jeopardy. I don't think so. Hallelujah. There's always going to be people that are going to live for God. Yes. Through good times, bad times, in between times, they are going to be found there. Sunday mornings, just like we are in the house of God, yes. worshiping the Lord. Right. There's always going to be people. He left himself without witness in the earth. That's scripture. And it tells me that there's always going to be somebody that is living for God. Yes. The Bible asks a question. That when he returns, will he find faith upon the earth? Yeah. The answer this morning is an unequivocal yes, he will. Yeah. Right, amen. Yeah. He will find the Lord <laughs> upon the earth. Amen. Now, Jamie's already quoted my scripture, but I think I'll just quote it again. It was found from, or is found, and you don't have to turn there, but it's found, and we know it, or if we don't know it, we should know it. We ought to know it really, really well. It's from John chapter number 8, verse number 31. The Bible says, Then saith Jesus to those Jews that believed on him, Continue you in my word, and you shall be my disciples indeed. Yes. For you shall know the truth, right. and the truth Ooh, will yes. make you free. Amen. Yes, amen. amen. Now notice that the Bible does not say you shall know the truth and you'll be free. That's not what it says. It says that you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you. Or in other words, the truth of the word of the Lord will have the power. Right. Right. That wherein were you lost, you can now be found. Wherein were you a slave, you can now be made free. Right. That power is in the Word of God. Yes, yes. and you shall know the truth. And the truth shall make you free. It can't be stopped. <laughs> Hallelujah. It can't be. They, you know, they, they, they say, and I was just wondering about this this morning. They say that prayer has been banned in certain areas, like our public schools. Let me ask you something. How can you stop prayer? You can't stop prayer right. with somebody that wants to pray. Right. You can't stop prayer there. Right. You can't stop prayer in the halls of government if there are people there or even one person there that has a mind to pray, how would you stop that? Yeah. Right. You could pray like Hannah prayed to where only her lips moved and she made no sound, but she prayed a prayer that was powerful enough that in her barren situation, God gave her a son. You can't stop prayer. You can outlaw it all you want to. You can ban it all you want to, but you'll never stop it. Amen. Right. Amen. Hallelujah. They say that there are places, and I know that those places exist. We heard about what was it last week, week before last, when Brother Barsani was here. We heard about one place that churches that preach truth have to go underground, but that's what they do. I know that in North Korea that it's it's against the law to even own a Bible, but there are people that do, that defy the government because they ascribe to a higher law and a higher power. Amen. And it's not the government, it's not a dictator that they are out to please. They want to please God. And how are you going to ban that? You can't ban people from living for the Lord just simply does not work. Right. You can't stop them from worshiping God if they have a mind, if they have a heart to worship the Lord. They're going to worship God. Right. Hallelujah. And you can't stop that. Praise the Lord. 
Yes. You can try to quiet them down all you want to try to quiet them down. It's not going to work. Right. People that know about the power of God, people that know about the love of God, people that have been blessed by the Lord, people that have been delivered, people that have got their sins, turn them loose. They're going to praise God. Many, many years ago in the book of Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar commanded, but it didn't matter who commanded, it didn't make any difference. There are people that are not going to bow to images, they're not going to dance to anybody's tune, they're going to live for God and God alone. They are going to worship. Praise the Lord. And it is true that uh, it's true. That's where our freedom comes from. Yes, amen. True. Praise God. Hallelujah. Now, being the day before Independence Day, amen, um, I just want to talk about some folks for a minute here, uh, people that uh, you probably have never heard of. You never heard of these folks, probably. Uh, maybe you did, but it, it's all likelihood you never heard of them. There's a a young man whose name was Joseph Plum Martin. I don't know how he got that middle name. P L U M B Plum. He was a Plum Martin. Hallelujah. He um, joined the Continental Army when he was 15 years old. He was um, a 15-year-old private in the Continental Army. Brimley and James age. Can you imagine that? Joseph Martin served in the Continental Army for seven years. And when he was discharged from the Army, when the war was over, the Revolutionary War, of course, when he uh, was discharged from the Army, Joseph Martin was a 22-year-old practice. He never made general or colonel or major or even sergeant or even corporal. He was still a private in the army. Now, people would never know about him, probably, except maybe his family, except some years later when he was uh, in his older age, he wrote a book that was entitled Private Yankee Doodle. <laughs> Hallelujah. And he talked about, in that book, he talked about nearly freezing to death at Valley Forge. And he also talked about nearly being scorched at the Battle of Mammoth on June 28, 1778. He talked about that. In his book, he said, I shot at people that I sincerely hoped that I never hit. <laughs> Amen. And he said, I wept over friends that were killed in battle. Man. And you probably never heard of him. He would never have considered himself to be a hero. He never made anything more private. He was just a common soldier. And he talked about just day in, day out in his book what it was like being a soldier during the Revolutionary War in the Continental Army, he talked about that. And the drudgery, the boredom that was offset by absolute terror. He talked about not having enough food to eat, not having enough warm clothes, and always being outnumbered and just day in, day out, put the tent up, take the tent down. <laughs> living for the Lord. But the thought that I got out of it, that he may have never considered himself to be a hero, but there is one thing that Joseph Martin had. He had perseverance. And he just stayed with it. And he marched when it's time to march, fought when it was time to fight, and just he just stayed with it. For seven years, just a common soldier, Nothing any more than that. 
and you most likely have never heard his name. Praise the Lord. But there is a tremendous message that comes out of his life. Amen. Right. Yes. James Fortin was only 14 years old. And he was a part of the crew of a, of a ship that uh, it was a uh, it was a merchant man. It uh, was not a naval ship. It was uh, it was a privateer. But it didn't matter. The British Navy attacked it anyway. Overcame the ship. Took the whole crew as captives. Um, James Fortin had another problem. He just happened to be black. And even though he was freeborn, uh, blacks that were uh, captured by the British were very promptly sold into slavery, whether they were freeborn or not. The British didn't care. And awaiting that being sold into slavery, James Fortin was put in a prison that also happened to be a ship and kept seven months below decks in a some sort of room that only had a three-foot ceiling because he couldn't stand up. But he stayed there for seven months, but somehow in all of that, this black kid that was a crew member of the ship somehow befriended the son of the captain of the British ship that had overcome them. Somehow they got to be friends. Somehow they got to be very good friends. Somehow to the place that when it came time for the captain's son that happened to also be 14 years old to go back to England that he wanted above everything else to take his friend James Fortum with him. He had permission from his father. He was all set. So he approached his friend with an idea, and James Thornton very promptly turned him down. Oh, he could have gone to England, and no doubt his life would have been much, much better in England. But James Thornton, even at 14 years old, said, I will not denounce my country, and I will not give up my American citizenship. Absolutely not. You know, there's some people who are going to stand. Regardless of what happens, there are some people that are they believe in something and they are going to stand for it. Praise God. Yeah. Hallelujah. So there's lessons that we learn out of this. Loyalty and perseverance. Praise the Lord. Come from these just common soldiers and sailors that were no more than kids, hardly. Hallelujah. And it wasn't just the, it wasn't just the men. Deborah Sampson was so was so taken with the cause of independence and being free of British rule, no no taxation without representation. You probably remember that that cry, Hallelujah! That being a lady, um, she was of course banned from serving in the military. But she desired to fight for her freedom and her independence so much that she dressed herself like a man and joined the Continental Army and fought the British for 17 months. She was in several different battles, wounded twice. Once, with a bullet in her leg, she dug that bullet out herself because she was afraid that if she sought medical help, that it might be determined that she was a female, so she just did it herself. And the next time she was shot in the leg, the bullet was far too deep for her to dig out, so she just left it there. It somehow healed up, and the story says that it was there for the rest of her life. Praise the Lord. There are some people that, that simply believe in some things. They believe in it enough that they're going to put some effort into it. They believe in it enough that they'll face the hardships and the dangers and the uncertainty, and they will go right on doing the best they can 
to promote what they believe in. Praise God. Anybody ever heard the story of Desmond Doss? He was there. There were eleven. There were eleven medics that received the Medal of Honor in the Second World War. That's not very many of the millions that served. There were eleven medics that received the highest, the highest medal that the United States had to offer. Desmond Doss was one of them. Desmond Doss had to fight to even get in the military because he let it be known that he was a conscientious objector and that he would not bear arms because of his religious beliefs. So he had to fight even to get into the army. But he finally, he finally did and convinced the army to let him be a medic. And they finally agreed, and he was trained as a medic. He was in several major, major battles. But the one that Desmond Dalt stood out in the Second World War was the Battle of Okinawa. Very, very bloody. In that battle of Okinawa was where Desmond Doss earned the Medal of Honor. It was said that on the battlefield that he was wounded four times on the battlefield, but he would not stop going back into the battle and taking out some of his fellow soldiers that were, that were wounded that would have died had he not got them out. Nobody knows the exact count, but they say it was between 75 and 100 soldiers that Desmond Doss personally saved and kept them from dying. When he was asked how in the world he could accomplish something like that, he said, I prayed that God would help me get that first one out. And when I got him out, I prayed that God would help me get one more. So I went back. And when I got him out, I prayed that God would help me get just one more. So I went back again. And again, and again. Hallelujah. You know, it's to people like this, just soldiers and people that have bought into a cause, it's people like this. It's not necessarily the generals. And I have nothing against them. It's not the army as a whole. It's people like this that we owe our freedom. Right. right. Praise the yes, Lord. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. That's all right. You can come to the left to stand and shout if you want to. Run around the building a time or two if you want to. If you got a firecracker in your pocket, by all means, set it off. Hallelujah. Praise God. The Vern Collins, you probably never heard that name either. Vern Collins uh, was born in Alpena, Arkansas, 1913. You probably know where Alpena is at. It's not a real big town. It probably wasn't in uh, 1913 either. Laverne Collins was a soldier of a different sort. Soldier she was, but of a different sort. Her family was a religious family. I, I don't know exactly what, what type. I don't know. But they were a rich, religious family. And her father that was nicknamed just B. Her father said that he had a word from the Lord before the worm was ever born. That God spoke to him and said that this child that your wife is carrying will be greatly used of the Lord. Hallelujah. Laverne Collins got the Holy Ghost in 1938 in a revival that was taking place in Denver, Arkansas. Praise the Lord. And she was baptized that same summer in Long Creek in Denver, Arkansas. Laverne Collins became a school teacher. But in 1943, 
she, um, she got a word from God that she would one day be a missionary. Teaching school in Harrison, Arkansas in the winter of 1954. The Lord spoke to her and said, it is now time for you to go to a mission, the mission field. And just a couple of months later, she left for Liberia, West Africa. Never having been there before, not knowing how to speak the language. Praise the Lord. With very little money, but just with a desire to fulfill what God had called her to do. Laverne Collins packed her bags and went to Liberia. Praise the Lord. She ministered in the schools. Um, she uh, taught Bible lessons. Uh, she uh, worked in the altar. She prayed people through to the Holy Ghost. She gave home Bible studies. She was in Liberia for only seven months. Laverne Collins died in Liberia. Why such a short time? Why years of getting ready? I don't know. John the Baptist was the same way. Years and years getting ready for the ministry that lasted six months. But it was so powerful that it's put down in the word of the Lord. And we still benefit today from what John the Baptist preached. Praise God. Why it turned out that way, I don't know. I'm telling you about people that you most likely have not heard about. Lucille Farmer, for instance. That same year, word of the Lord came to her when she hardly knew God. It was, it was in also in 1943. Must have been a very good year. Praise the Lord. And when she heard from God, like a whole lot of other people, probably some that sit here today, most definitely one that stands on this platform, that when he heard the word of God, immediately all the possibilities sprang up of why this can't happen, why I can't do this, why I can't go there, why I can't be used. I guess it's just human flesh that we feel that way, but it looks to me like Lucille Farmer had some pretty legitimate arguments. Her husband had just left her. She was now divorced. And not only that, she had four small kids. And how in the world could it ever happen that, that she would ever, ever go to a, a mission field with all the burdens that she already had to bear? How's that going to work? But somehow she mustered up the courage and contact the foreign missions divisions only to be told that we are so sorry, Sister Farmer, but we no longer send single ladies to mission fields. And then she was encouraged to just go there on her own, which was also, as far as flesh is concerned, was also a impossibility. But feeling it so strong, you know what, folks? Joseph bore a lot of things, and you know his story. You talk about people getting hurt in church. It wasn't a bunch of sinners that did to Joseph what was done to Joseph. Right. It was his family, yes. that brethren, that sold him into slavery. Right. His attitude could very easily have been, if I ever get a hold of one of them, It easily could have been that. But the attitude of Joseph was, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. Yes. Oh, do you feel something right here? Yes, thank you. Thank Who knows sometimes what God lets us walk through? Right. Who knows sometimes what's actually written down in the plan of our lives, of our ministry? that we are going to face that's there for reasons that we don't even know. Right. One thing Joseph would never do, he would never let his dream die. Never. Praise the Lord. And because he wouldn't let it die, it didn't die in the heart of God either. And the Lord brought him to the very place that he intended from the beginning. Amen.
turned down. She could have very easily given up, but she didn't. She kept on praying. And in 1964, 20 years after the Lord had spoken to her, Lucille Farmer went to Quito, Ecuador, mission field. Her story tells about a lot of dangers. There are situations that were not uncommon on mission fields that were predominantly Catholic. Some of those mission fields, it was um, encouraged that uh, these people spread this false Christian doctrine that the Lord would actually bless you if you killed them. So the dangers. Seal Farmer talked about days of walking just to get to a village to be able to preach in that village. Walking or riding a mule. And she said sometimes the walking was preferred to riding a mule. Hallelujah. Praise God. Bad, bad food. They brought to her one particular place a bowl full of white grubs. And her interpreter that was with her told her sister farmer, uh, that's quite a delicacy among these people. And you have got to eat those grubs. And she said, there is no possible way. I absolutely cannot do it. And the interpreter said, if you don't do it, your ministry here will be absolutely useless. They will not listen to you. They have brought you this to honor you. Quite an honor, right? And if you don't partake, they will be offended and they will not accept your ministry. So all things are made clean with thanksgiving according to the word of the Lord. Hallelujah. And I think this is one of those situations where you would not simply say grace, but you would pray. <laughs> Churches were attacked. Churches were physically attacked. Churches were spiritually attacked. But through it all, revival prevailed. Lucille Farmer started personally several churches in Ecuador. Hallelujah. You probably never heard of her. She's not there. She... If you were to look, you, you won't find the name Lucille Farmer or Laverne Collins in Hebrews chapter number 11. Their names are not there. But I will tell you something. Somewhere there is a record. Somewhere it is written up. Hallelujah. Of how these folks were obedient to God. Soldiers, yes they were. Praise God. Alma and Lawrence LaRue started 12 churches. This has not been that far back. It was, well, like I said, it, it don't seem to me like it's been that far back. To uh, Christian Brinley and some other folks that are here this morning, it's going to sound like dinosaur days. <laughs> It didn't seem that long back to me. It was in the 40s and 50s that Alma and Lawrence Lerner, they served 12 churches, 11 in Missouri, one in Arizona. I had the privilege of sitting in their living room and talking to these folks in their old age, just a few months before Brother LaRue died, actually. Asked them, how did you do that? How, how did that work? And, you know, we're... I guess as being humans, we, we're always looking for some secret formula or something. Now, this is what we did. This is how we decorate the church. This is the music we play. This is how we did it and attracted people. We had revival. No, he said it was very simple. He said we fasted and we prayed and we witnessed. That's how we did it. Every church was started the exact same way. And even in the early 60s, they were pastoring churches that ran close to 200. That was a big Pentecostal church back in those days. Hallelujah. They did it. Praise God. The help of the Lord, they did it. Amen. I like the stories of those old-time preachers. Yeah. 
Praise the Lord. There was a preacher that came to our house one day. It was in, it was in the fall of 1975. Ruth and I were not in church. We weren't even close to being in church. Matter of fact, if you looked at us and looked at our lifestyle, you'd probably shake your head and say, they will never be in church. We had a stereo we were trying to sell. And um, somebody knocked on the door, and lo and behold, it was a preacher. <laughs> now, we had a little party the night before. And sitting on top of that stereo that this preacher came to look at, it was interested in buying, there was a big old pyramid made out of beer cans. <laughs> <laughs> sitting right there. <laughs> that we had emptied the night before. Our house smelled like stale smoke of cigarettes and uh, some other things. <laughs> and we were so embarrassed. But he said, that's okay, that's all right. Don't worry about it, no problem. And he came in and he looked at the stereo. As I remember, he didn't buy it, but he did come and look at it. <laughs> Praise God. That, that pastor, that preacher's name was Carlton Johnson. And two years after that, it was Carlton Johnson that baptized Ruth and I in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. That same good Not little because he was young, he was not, but he was little. He baptized us in Jesus' name. When we started evangelizing, the first revival that we preached was in the church that Carlton Johnson pastored. Now, I'd be honored to be there at any time. But what really touched me was this. He knew my past. He knew. He knew where I came from. He knew what I had been involved with. He knew. But he knew something greater. Yes, he knew that there is a power yes. wherein you were blind. Right. Now you yes. can see. Amen. He understood that there is blood stains that cover all sin stains. He knew that if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things have passed away. Yeah. Behold, all things are now new. Yeah. Yeah. He understood that where I was bound, now I'm free. Praise yeah. the Lord. Yeah. Oh, the things that I was a slave to. Amen. Not a slave to any longer. He knew that. Praise the Lord. These, these preachers and preachers' wives that I'm telling you about here, you probably never heard their names unless you heard me mention them. They weren't known outside, usually their own districts or their own area or where their church was at. They weren't, they weren't well known. They kind of like, they were kind of like Joseph Martin. They, uh, they just persevered. They told me their stories uh, of, of having to really pray hard just to make it home from camp meeting because the car's out of gas. They, they talked about the lean times, but they also talked about the times of just incredible revival. So a lot like Joseph Martin, they... They just put one foot in front of the other and live for God. Right. That's how they did. They, none of them, they, they, they didn't own private jets. That some people feel that is a mark of your 
success as a pastor or evangelist. They, they didn't have that. They never lived in luxury homes. They, they never had mega churches. Like also some people think that that's, that is the mark of your success if you pastor a, a mega church. They weren't famous. They like Joseph Martin and James Fortin. They were just kind of they were just kind of common people. They, that's just uh, just like like Joe Martin. They, but unlike Joe Martin, they fought in a war that was eternal. And even though they had laid down their swords. Even though they had passed off the scene and none of them are living now. There are people on, still on this earth, and I am one of them, that are blessed and that benefit from their ministries. Their perseverance, their unshakable faith. An uncompromising love of the truth afforded to me and a lot of other people the opportunity to be free. Yes. Yes, amen. I'm preaching this morning, Independence Day. Hallelujah. And I am loose from my chains. I'm free of my shackles. Hallelujah. I'm no longer even addicted. I can walk in liberty, and I do. And I have been made free. Because there were people that went before me that stayed with the truth when it was not popular. And prayed when it wasn't easy to pray. that shouted, oh my Lord. I never have, I've always heard it, and I guess it's, it's no doubt it's just an expression, but you've heard people talk about being in a service where people dusted the ceiling with their socks. Y'all ever heard that? Well, I've never been in a service where they actually did that. I've seen some pretty wild things, but I've never been in a service where they actually dusted the ceiling with their socks. But I want to tell you something. I've been in one or two more I thought they were going to. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise God. I was in a service one night that got so, that, that, that they got, oh, I'm, it was one of the wildest services I ever seen. People were getting the Holy Ghost. They were fell out on the floor. Um, I've seen a few literal holy rollers. I have seen that happen. The rolling across the altar area. And I don't know how it happened. I don't know where it came from. But I've seen something go flying across the auditorium. And I thought, that looked like a football. <laughs> football. It went from that side to that side. And somebody called it over there and it came back across. And when it came back across, I knew it was a thing. <laughs> somebody threw. And my first thought was, oh, Lord, I just put these chandeliers up and they're going to tear one of them down. <laughs> Freedom, praise the Lord. You, you can't ban worship. You can make all the laws you want to. It's, it's not going to stop people from worshiping the Lord right. that have been set free. If they have been set free, you can't bind them. You can't ban prayer. You cannot stop prayer. It's right. impossible to stop. Because those people, if they have a mind to pray, they're going to pray. Yes. And they don't care what your law says. They have been set free. They have had an independence day. Yes. Hallelujah. You. you can't stop people from living for God. They're going to go right on. They have been set free. Aren't you glad to be another among those people? Yeah, yeah. They have been set free. Jesus set free shall be free indeed with the blessing of 
having my own personal independence day, and I have. Hallelujah. I celebrate my independence day in September. How about you folks? <laughs> September? Some people, some people celebrate it in December or October or whatever. The day they found the Lord. Hallelujah. Sometimes people say, and some of the songs say, that's when the, that's when the Lord found me. Well, he knew where you were at the whole time. And I'm preaching this morning simply Independence Day. And if you have had one, and you know what I'm talking about, I want you to stand to your feet and let's worship the Lord. My eyes have seen the glory yes. of the coming of the Lord.